Ladies and gentlemen, this is the one. This is the one which finally makes it. The first Kingsfield that's perfect. The one where an affinity for antiquated design philosophies is not a prerequisite for appreciation. The one whose visuals are not your biggest enemy. The one whose minimalistic direction, mostly conveyed with quality of life upgrades, kills the aimless wandering. The first one which, no asterisk needed, holds up, I feel. And funnily enough, in many ways, it's because of how much of the Kingsfield license it dropped. It's not set in a dungeon, and it doesn't take place prior to its story's looming cataclysmic event. In many ways, it's a mixture of the first and second game, notably release-wise, launching outside of Japan, like the second game, but not in Europe, like the first game. And it realizes the possible scope of this experience. In the franchise thus far, we've seen console-locked dungeon crawling stretched, into a proto-3D metroidvania and the establishment of a truly interesting fantasy world. I've showered these games with praise thus far and I'm happy to finally be playing my favorite one in the franchise. No offense to Kingsfield 4 fans. Hello everyone, I'm AC Aesthetics, and in this video we'll be going over Kingsfield 3 in depth. This video will be picking up where my previous two Kingsfield videos left off, so I suggest watching those first if you haven't already. If you've done that, or if you can't be bothered, I say grab yourself a cup of coffee and strap in as we take a look back at Kingsfield 3. In the beginning, the world of Valicia was in chaos. To unite the world, God Velad split himself into Seath, the white dragon, and Gyra, the black dragon. In this act, the principles of light and darkness were also created, but Seath and Gyra both became bitter enemies and started taking their roles as deities to be worshipped and hated a bit too seriously. The lad could not destroy his creations, that act is forbidden even for a god in this world, apparently, so instead, a thousand years of conflict started in the world of men. A holy bloodline was eventually created in the land of Verdite, which was destined to create a chosen hero who would destroy the dragons and unite the world. Before his ascension, however, Seath gave a dark crystal to the high elves of Melanet, which Gyra broke, and in doing so, Gyra was destroyed, kinda. The hero of destiny was Jean Alfred Forrester, and he would overcome the horrors of the royal graveyard and, after killing Reinhardt III, leave with a moonlight sword and unite the world becoming a holy king of light. The Moonlight Sword was created by Gyra as a means of finding a powerful warrior to come to Melanath and revive it. But, after the sword was stolen, Jean did not head to the island. He sent Alexander Thornton Regimus. Alexander assembled the fragments of the dark crystal Gyra broke and had them assembled into the Dark Slayer with which he slew Gyra. Then, he came back to Verdite with both swords and handed them to Jean. The two swords were sealed in the castle's tower, and peace was restored to the land forever. For five years. And then, Jean became incredibly ill. He couldn't move, and for a month sealed himself in his bedchambers, making inhuman howlings which echoed through the halls. Miraculously, however, overnight he recovered, but something was different. The noble king had become cruel. He began abusing his subjects, and left his duty to slay the demons, instead letting them roam the land freely. Every day the demons ravaged the land, and the Holy King of Light seemed somewhat amused by this development. Alexander was on Melanat when this all began, but when he learned of the king's plight, he came back to Verdite to offer his assistance to his old friend. But what met him was not the warm gaze of a man he once called brother, but eyes of pure darkness, and Alexander knew immediately that Jean had come under the influence of a foreign power. Alexander tried to recover Jean with various exorcisms and magic rituals, but failure eventually drove him desperate. In that desperation, he ascended the castle tower, growing ever more weary with each step. This creeping sense of doom brought him to his knees when he finally reached the top and saw shattered on the floor the Holy Moonlight Sword and absent the Dark Slayer. Alexander knew that the fight ahead was a fight of destiny itself, and to tip the scales in the favor of light, he entrusted the four magical principles 
which the next chosen hero would need to ascend to the aids of the king. He then took the broken hilt of the Moonlight Sword and joining its last remaining power with his own, sealed off the castle in a dome of light. With his last ounce of strength, Alexander then called out to Jean's son, Lyle Austin Forrester, to inherit his father's nobility, to, as the direct Japanese translation goes, become a heavenly man. He tells him that he is Destiny's next chosen warrior as his father had been before him, and that he was to find the four magical powers and save the country. Lyle had been in the care of a high elf named Leon for ten years ever since Alexander sealed Jean away, and now, 17 years of age, he embarks on an adventure. And what an adventure it is. This is a Kingsfield game after all, so you know what to expect. Minimalistic storytelling? Check. Darkness? Check. Bleak ambience? Hammered home with the suffering NPCs? Check. Happy fantasy story ending? Check. Hmm. Well, k kinda. See, Kingsfield 3 has two endings depending on how deeply you decide to engage it. It's possible to overpower Gene in the end and become the new king only to yourself fall under Seath's influence, but it's also possible to overcome Seath. You can find the lingering form of Gyra in the bottom of the royal cemetery from the first game. Gyra exists now merely as thought and impulse, with nothing but hatred for Seath and if you released the fairy from the stone to reveal the magic bridge and prompt Gyra, the dragon will reforge the Moonlight Sword for you, longer than it's ever been, by the way, to destroy Seath once and for all. Bad ending? A good ending. But more than that, these endings thread the dispersed approaches to fantasy this series has been utilizing thus far into a coherent whole. Remember how in the first game we met a fairy which gave us a magic sword and the world was a straightforward fantasy? Then in the second game we saw where the fairy was manufactured and learned that it was all a ploy to lure a warrior to revive Gyrand. All of a sudden the fantasy had this layer of sort of cynical mystery to it. Yeah, this game realizes both of these approaches. It's much more melancholy than both previous entries and Although it doesn't backpedal on the more cynical approach of the second game, it does turn the cynicism on itself. Sure, these fairies are made in test tubes, but they're still made by a magical dragon, so what's so unfantastical about it? Keep this threading of the different styles sentiment in mind as we go forwards, because successfully achieving this is something I'll be commending the game on as we proceed. But to continue our talk on the adventure, we need to flesh out this game a bit more, and where better to start than the beginning? In these games so far, we've started naked and armed only with a sword. Kingsville 3 doesn't deviate from that tried and true method with the exception of the light magic which we can cast right from the get-go. It's a surprisingly useful tool this early on, and it's also a nice little bit of characterization. If you haven't played the game, then take this from me. When you're in a dungeon, and an enemy casts a Magic of Darkness, and you're 20 minutes removed from your last save point, it feels epic to cast this spell. You totally buy that your guy has some sort of destiny. You feel like Frodo with the light of a Rendiel in Shelob's cave. Also, unlike previous games, we actually start out in a field. The mood is set right away with an ominous red sky which goes a long way to communicate that bad things are a brewin. And our heading is also set up right away as on the horizon we can see Verdite Castle. We're meant to go there in the end and the first area after the opening is found by marching towards it, making it a nice bit of player direction. Little touches like this are what distinguishes Kingsfield 3 from its predecessors? It's much more directed, but the direction always takes the form of some gameplay mechanic or level design, so you might not actually notice that they've cut like 80% of the aimless wandering compared to previous games. Take for example the game's two maps. The first one is the overworld map, which freed the level designers from making distant landmarks after the castle seen in the opening area. 
I would have much preferred more of those landmarks, but in terms of informing the player of their heading, the old world map is still a straight upgrade from last time around. The second map, I think, could very well be the best new inclusion in this entire franchise, and one which sadly did not return for Kingsfield 4, or if it did I couldn't find it, and that's the Pixie map. Two problems which have plagued this series is maps so far are that A. Although they mark your location, they were too big to easily intuit, and B. They didn't mark where anything else was, so you'd need to intuit that by looking at the general geometry around you, translating it to a 2D image, and finding it on the map. Here, the maps are much smaller, which is a godsend, and although the pixie map has no landmarks or symbols to designate where which characters are, it's always much smaller than the area maps in previous games, so road memorization is much more manageable a way to pin everything's location. Also, it does that ratchet and clank thing where the map fills in where you've already gone, which makes thorough exploration easier. Unlike previous games, this world is hard segmented into its biomes, and like in the first game, you gradually thread your way through each one in a linear progression. Like I said earlier, our goal gameplay-wise is to reach Verdite Castle, but we're also searching for the Icreus items, the Moonlight Sword, and the Secret of the Axelector, which threads back to the Icreus items. Those all individually warp the player back to a specific area on the map when used, but once you unlock their secret, you get a universal warp item, which will open up the world to you like never before in this franchise. It might be fair to say that there has never been as much freedom in a Kingsfield game as there is here, which might sound strange since I just said it's a linear progression, but it helps to put it into proper context. Uh, Kingsfield 1 did the pearl necklace game design thing where open areas are connected with tight bottlenecks. Kingsfield 2 did the bowl of spaghetti thing where linear areas bleed in and out of each other creating an interconnected and open world. Kingsfield 3 is structured sort of like a tree. It gets more expansive as you progress from the linear trunk, but the expanse is mostly optional. Wood equals must, leaves equals you can. I know that's a dumb way of putting it, but I bet you won't forget it. There's a lot of optional content in this game, and because of the Icreus item's ability to warp you back to towns and across the map, you're going to retread old ground more than you did in Kingsfield 1 for lore, uh, armor, resources, etc. Then you'll stumble upon a quest which gives you more to do and fleshes out the world, and what do you know? It's like a perfect marriage of Kingsfield 1 and Kingsfield 2. World design wise, level design does a hard pivot from the second game back to the first, and I wonder if this can be attributed to the team having learned a lesson last time around. The visuals just aren't there yet for a truly open 3D world, especially one locked in the PlayStation 1, so let's swallow our pride and go back to the less ambitious format which worked better and let's use trickery to convey the world rather than artificial feeling geometry. And what trickery it is, the world has a lot of ledges to convey elevation, but it is almost entirely flat, with the major exceptions being in select dungeons, the most ambitious of which being the Cave of Shudom and Verdite Castle, who also share the distinction of being the game's least blocky dungeons. Not that blocky dungeons are a problem, if anything it reads as kind of authentic. The overworld is much more natural looking than environments in this franchise were before, so interiors being blocky just reads as humans made blocky temples and blocky dungeons. For the first time, a Kingsfield's terrain looks like the terrain it's supposed to be, but the game pays the price for this and its decision to go with many small dungeons rather than one behemoth. The heftiest price being the general gameplay loop beginning to feel incredibly video game. -y. The dungeons each do something unique. Um, the Cave of Shudam has you killing all the golems. The Forest of Varde has you navigating an interactive maze. Verdite Castle in the end is a brutal gauntlet. 
Noel Lake is a memorization game where you test a path and then gamble on your ability for 3D spatial recognition. Uh, the Passage of Death is just terrible. Imagine Sense Fortress from Dark Souls, except it looks like this. Your save point is as far back as 20 minutes, and you're looking for a key in a hidden room. Ugh. I actually read that the Promia's armor set nullifies all damage done by traps, but man, I did not search out all the Promias or have the patience for the uh, dwarf blacksmith to craft the thing for me. Anyway. In spite of the dungeon's variety, and each one trying something unique, or maybe because of it, you become almost painfully aware of the general gameplay loop. There's not enough done to differentiate them gameplay-wise, but they're a bit too visually distinct, and when the radically different biomes all play so similar, it, it does sort of undercut the believability of the terrains, but seeing as the only alternatives would be to drastically reinvent the gameplay or cut back on the terrain variety, it feels like the compromise we got was the best on offer. If feeling gamey is a byproduct of a more focused attempt to present the world, then I'll cop that. Because it's a world I really wanted to see more of. It's interesting to think about the cost of variety being the shattering of the illusion of variety and Having thoroughly explored Kingsfield 3, I think I understand why the areas in Kingsfield 4 were so much more aesthetically contained and why that game opted to pick up the threat from Shadow Tower rather than here, gameplay-wise. Because Kingsfield 3 is about as far as I think this gameplay's presentational capabilities can be stretched without suffering diminishing returns. I think it still mostly comes together and it's probably because of the stuff they did change, which admittedly was not much. There were the aforementioned maps and level design overhauls, but things like movement remain the same. When the world does succeed in making different locations feel different, it's largely because of environmental hazards innate to the levels, rather than any change in our means of interacting with it. Kazon, for example, is super dark and it has nearly invisible ghosts all around and magical blasts coming at you from the darkness, so you can't navigate it quite like you do Raluco or Quist. The path of poison urges haste and healing, while the passage of death urges caution. New challenges for an old movement scheme. Ditto that for combat. Inclusions like the X-Elector Sword, which upgrades with you aside, we're still dancing around enemies while our power bar regenerates to deal damage. If you ever wondered why the Souls games are so backstab centered, it's because they're emulating this. But new enemy types and new level design philosophies force you to approach combat scenarios in new ways. Also, since the areas are as separated as they are, the second game's enemy placement is brought over and with it the tactical consideration of our loadout. The first game had so many varied enemy types on each floor that if you wanted to get tactical and equip the best weapon for each enemy, you'd be shifting in and out of the equipment menu every 30 seconds. The second game had predictable enemies in diverse areas, so you'd only need to shift every time you explored a new one. Kingsfield 3 bringing this back should be a universal good, but because of the game's more linear structure and because of the need to upgrade the x selector, when you finally find a consistent enemy type, which is weak to say crushing damage, your crushing weapon might not have been worth carrying around still, having been power crept by better loot. And if you want to smoothly upgrade the x selector, it might be your only weapon through the entire game. You can choose to not upgrade it and still complete the game, or you can wait until later in the game and do a 10 to 20 minute grind on it, but those are suboptimal choices when you consider the game's aspirations for realized roleplaying. It doesn't make sense for Lyle to not use his best weapon, and it feels very clunky that he has to swing the X selector X many times on enemies for it to grow in power, H however you slice it, it's not the best of any world. On the positive side, the combat's visual information is much better than before, 
enemies don't just have hit animations, they also blink red when you deal damage to them. Hitbox quality is quite scattershot here, some enemies you need to sort of wet yourself into to deal damage to, but that's business as usual with this license. I noted enemy placement already. Not only does this game segment the map like the second one did and place enemies in consistent locations, it places them in more sensical locations than it ever did before. It just dawned on me a few minutes into playing the game for the first time, but these Venus flytrap enemies that have been with us from the beginning, they don't make a lot of sense in dungeons. They're plants. They need sunlight, and after seeing them on an open field, it does sorta of look jarring when I go back and see them in dark caves. In-game, I know that these enemies are only in the fields because they escaped the dungeons which they were in, which... okay. But placements are looking right here more so than even in the second game. The cave of Chudam has golems and skeletons, King Harvine's palace has faces and these wind guys, the Path of Poison has Jellos and Quailac. Spiders aren't actually poisonous, but whatever. The Cave of the Dwarf has weird mineral monsters and scorpions. That cursed town of Kassan has tree man monsters and ghosts. Ghosts represented with 2D sprites this time around. Now, don't get me wrong, I liked the borderline hallucinogenic enemy design of previous games. Remember those trippy faces in the second game? The game's enemies are all built with simplistic shapes, and previously they added a sort of trippy ambience to the game, but compare the ghosts from Kingsfield 2 to the ghosts here, and yeah, I like the gritty new ones better. Remember those tree stump monsters from the first game? This is what they look like now, pretty cool, right? Remember how FromSoft didn't want to make boxy face textures last time around so faces were blank? That approach returns, but in this grittier world, it's less trippy and more like a nightmare. Late game, we also find these earth-shaking giants who will mess you up and these blue demon guys and... Man, I'm feeling the visuals like I didn't before. Both in terms of technology and aesthetic, Kingsfield 3 is a beautiful game. I've sung the praises of the previous games for their jittery wall textures, a 5th gen stable which I've got quite a fondness for and am happy is seeing embraced by more people as time goes on, but because the images here are so much more detailed than before, the returning jitteriness starts to feel almost like texture. The gritty rocky surfaces feel grittier, the grass sharper and all this etch communicates oppression, and that's very apt because Kingsfield 3 is a very oppressive feeling game. The fog of war does that thing I always talk about in my Silent Hill videos where it makes you claustrophobic in an open area. Openness insinuates a free flow of information, and the fog of war kills it. Think of the atmosphere here this way, previous Kingsfields were claustrophobic because they were set in tight dungeons. This game is claustrophobic because it's set in an open world which comes at you from all sides. And you might not have noticed this because of the more oppressive ambience, but the game is way more lenient than last time around. I noted already how the game is more directed, which focuses the experience, but there's also a surprising lack of pitfalls where you just die and need to reload. Remember how the second game let you screw yourself with unescapable holes you'd need to warp out of? Well, never fear, Kingsfield 3 is here, and it has completely overhauled the world design and progression system. Take keys. The first ones we get are the Silviera keys, which work the same as the Rhombus keys, which in my last video I erroneously said could not be picked up against once used. Um, Apparently I was just angling my guy wrong when I tried. Anyway, the, the Sylvia keys work the same. You open an area, explore it, leave it, and lock it up again by taking the key. Stackable multi-use keys are functionally the same as a single master key once you've collected enough of them, and once you have the master key, it's very difficult to justify thorough exploration, which means a lot of a game's depth and optional content will be missed. 
this might be why From Software softly etched out their utility in this one. For the most part, Kingsfield 3's areas have their own keys or puzzles to solve, and as for pitfalls, on paper, removing them diminishes the caution, but we're still running dedicated safe points, brutal difficulty, and resource management, so really, it's dialing the caution meter from a 10 to a 9.9 .9 to give the player a better experience. Design-wise, the key overhaul is another example of the game pivoting back to the first game rather than the second in that each area is a self-contained puzzle. That being said, there is still an appreciation for the power puzzles have to make the player explore the world. The final level requires two keys, one of which is found in the castle itself, and the other is found outside in a nearby cemetery. So the second game's style of having puzzles be solved by exploring areas far away from the puzzles and threading the whole world together that way isn't completely lost. In the main narrative, it's diminished spectacularly, but it's not lost. Even though the cemetery is right outside of the castle, it's still outside of the castle. That dungeon is not self-contained, and there are a few more places and quests which have you exploring the world. To gain entrance to Harvine's palace, you must first find the Wind Crystal. To acquire the Promius armor set, you must find Promius fragments, etc. The game has expectations of the player that they thoroughly explore the world around them, like the second one did. It's just that if you're ignoring optional content, that might not be apparent to you. Going back to my award-winning analogy from earlier, if you're not interested in leaves, you may find the game to be a bare tree. But the developers added two features to make understanding the world easier. The first one, and this is going to genuinely blow your mind, the item descriptions have been moved into the inventory screen. Uh-huh. I think I forgot to mention this in my previous videos, but Item description used to be locked to specific NPCs. You'd travel the world and find these fortune teller dudes with whom you could check each item individually to get lore. The system is still here for certain items, but for most of them, you just check the lore in the menu. And get this gang, the item description is tied to the intelligence stat. And irony time over, I love this. Our dude actually needs to go into the world, get wise, and then he'll have a clue about the operations of his items. The other new inclusion which helps players understand the world is a shaking up of the transient quests. Up until now, quests have basically consisted of a character offhandedly saying something and you testing out whether what they said had some utility. A miner in the first game said that his son ran off with his map, and you get the quest to find a map if you want it. You can just walk past him, or talk to him and not get the map, or get the map and just not talk to the dude. Because quests aren't represented outside of the conversations you get them in and advance them in, Kingsfields up until now have always felt very transient. This time around, however, we have a conversation log which means it's time for me to shamelessly backpedal from the grandstanding I've been doing in this series so far because I really like having this thing. It solves all of the issues I did have with the transient quests and it introduces none of the issues of conventional quest logs. I've thus far praised the transient quests because of how authentic they make the experience and my aversion to checklists has to do with the way they rip the mask of the experience and reveal just how much you're playing a game. Collect 10 fire salts for the blacksmith in Riften, 3 out of 10 collected. But if you recall my Morrowind video, logs don't bother me when they are in line with the presentation of the world. Collecting fire salts in Skyrim is a literal checklist. It's stuff to do. But bringing Lin's ring to the dragon fountain is something you need to test based on what she offhandedly said, and that doesn't betray the experience far from it. Also, 
This feature is another way the aimless wandering is killed. Is it a straight on upgrade from previous games? Well, depends. I didn't use it in my first playthrough and I'm happy I didn't, full disclosure, I didn't know about it then, but I, I did in my subsequent playthroughs and I found that in-game this functions less like the developers giving you a grab bag of assorted stuff to do and much like how the player marker on the map simulates Lyle's environmental awareness, this lock simulates Lyle's memories of the conversations he's had with the people he met. And because of that, I feel the people in this world and their stories resonate more than they ever did before. The dungeons are all very distinct from each other conceptually, and they mostly provide a unique experience, which is an improvement from the last two games. The way they accomplished this was with the aforementioned varied completion goals, and I like how accomplishing these feeds back into the game's fantasy roots. In the first game, we got a harp which raised bridges and a wand which teleported us to the beginning warp point in each level. In the second game, we got a flute which revealed bridges and gates which let us warp back to activated guideposts. Here, we have a magical key which moves tree trunks, we have a wand which unpetrifies, a host of warp items, boots which let us walk on water, and a magical herb which cures a young boy's illness just to name some, and these items go a long way to imbue the world with magic. Like in no Kingsfield before, this game's narrative bottlenecks have to do with the player interacting with the fantastical and solving problems for the suffering people in this world. Kingsfield 1 detailed, among other things, the emergence of the Holy Moonlight Sword into the Kingdom of Verdite. Jean garnered the favor of the mysterious deity of the forest and was given it. In Kingsfield 2, that gift was retconned to have been a ploy by the evil and ancient dragon Gyra to find a powerful warrior which it could lure to its resting place in the island of Melanat to revive it. The sword was stolen, but the quest to retrieve it was not carried out by Jean, it was Alexander, and in Melanat, Alexander garnered the favor of the other evil dragon, Seath, and from shards of a broken dark crystal, Alexander had the Dark Slayer constructed. By the end of that game, both magical swords of Verdite were in Verdite. This much, we all know. This game introduces the third magical sword in the X-Selector. Made from a crystal substance and capable of growing along with its wielder, the Moonlight Sword had the element of light, the Dark Slayer had all elements but light. The X-Selector also has the element of light in the end, but it's also a core component of the Icreus Key, which grants the player the ability to warp to the numerous healing springs in Verdite. The Kingsville license thus far has been very heavily focused on magical swords, so as a cap-off to the Verdite trilogy, it's fitting that a new one was constructed. And it's also very emblematic of the threading together of the two fantasy styles. The Holy Moonlight Sword, in the first game, was a magical sword of light bestowed upon a chosen hero by a magical fairy and dragon. Straightforwards, conventional fantasy. The Dark Slayer was handed to an accidental hero, one who wasn't supposed to be there and it was constructed, not revealed to have been hidden in a stone sword all along. The X Selector is created for our protagonist, but it's still a magical sword in the end and its relationship with him is also true to the series. The light sword for the chosen hero, the dark sword for the accidental hero, and now another light sword for another chosen hero, but one whose rival is the original chosen hero who now wields the dark sword which belonged to the accidental hero. Kingsfield 3, like the second game, is more than happy to question the conventions of fantasy, but more than even Kingsfield 1, it revels in them when it comes time for spectacle, and it really feels like this franchise has come back home. And Lyle himself is very emblematic of how the franchise has grown. Jean was a master swordsman prior to going into the Royal Graveyard. 
Alexander was also a capable warrior prior to getting shipwrecked by the demons on Melanad. Lyle is a lot more like Luke Skywalker. He's a kid given an insurmountable task and his success, counterintuitively, has a lot more to do with how he stays true to his past than fantasy convention rather than how much he grows away from it. He kills monsters and grows more powerful, but he also has relationships with the people he knew. He carries on Lin's will to place her ring in the Dragon Fountain to learn from Alexander the magic sword attack. He routinely returns to his home to buy resources, but still. And the only way to have Gyra's thought form reconstruct the Holy Moonlight Sword is to first draw the hilt from Alexander's grave and then free the fairy from its stone in the final boss area from the very first game, which, by the way, I love it when games do this, when they uh, <laughs> have you visit areas from previous games. This game's ending sees Lyle enter Verdite Castle and slay his way through a Kingsfield stable final boss arena gauntlet, consisting of overpowered dragons in a dungeon, and then he takes the fight to the Fallen King his own father. Jean draws the Dark Slayer and teleports the duo to a hellscape where they duke it out and if the player has the Holy Moonlight Sword, the battle will end with Jean redeemed. He'll bless the Moonlight Sword with the last of his power and Lyle will then slay Seath, undoing the mistake God made and putting an end to the Verdite nightmare. This might very well be the biggest collection of conventional fantasy tropes I've ever seen in a game, and I love it. K Kingsville 3 threats the dispersed approaches to fantasy embodied by its predecessors and elevates this license into something truly special. Notice how personal this story has been. The final boss is a literal aspect of the creator god and has been acting from behind the scenes from the very get-go, but I've only shown him to you once. Because it's not really a man versus dragon game, it's a personal journey and a conclusion to an epic fantasy narrative. Seath is a tool to show the power dark influence has over people, and that's very Kingsfield too, but triumph is found in traditional fantasy nobility. You get the magic sword of light and win the fight. There's a lot more to it, considering the light sword is not acting on the behalf of a benevolent and loving deity, but rather an incorporeal immortal dragon who exists solely as an impulse of pure hatred, but it's still a noble man with a light sword, slaying the evil dragon. Kingsfield 3 is a perfect cap-off to its trilogy. It satisfactorily closes the loop on every theme touched on so far, and it managed to bridge the gap between the first game's earnestness and the second game's cynicism. All good things must come to an end, and although this franchise continued, the story of Guy Seed, the Forester bloodline, and the Holy Swords of Verdite did not. Kingsfield 3 capped off that narrative, and in my opinion it did so with a bang. I agree with the general consensus that Kingsfield 4 is much more at home on the top 10 games of all times list than any other Kingsfield since it's so much more refined, but for my particular fancy, Kingsfield 3 did it better. It's earnest, it's fantasy, it's horror, it's weird, it's antiquated, and I'm all about that. And if you are too, and you haven't played these games, I hope I've convinced you to give them a shot. If you think you've been spoiled, don't worry. You actually haven't seen the half of it. I've barely touched on the High Elves, I haven't said anything about Meral Ur, and I didn't even mention Necron in my last video. Looking back, I've barely even scratched the surface, but that just means there's more for you to find if you decide to take a look back at Kingsford. Thanks for watching. This ends our retrospective look back at the Verdite trilogy, but there's more to come. Kingsfield 4, although not a Verdite game, and the Shadow Towers and other assorted pre Miyazaki FromSoft games will be the bread and butter of this channel for the foreseeable future, with my plan being to segue each month from making my video game and making videos for you guys. 
Each video making month I'll strive to make two videos, one on a From Soft title and one on something you guys have some input into. To catch these polls when they go out you'll need to be subscribed and also click the bell icon. For some reason YouTube seems to think it's wise to NOT send notifications to subscribers, you know, because why would I want to be up to date on the channels I subscribe to? So anyway, I, I implore you to click the bell icon if you want to actually subscribe. If you like this video, you might like my other Kingsfield videos if you haven't watched them already, or the Demon Souls videos if you have. Throughout July, I'll be getting back to work on my game and will be coding behaviors for items, I'll be experimenting with multi-usable scripts for NPC storylines, and I'll be fleshing out the combat system. For more frequent updates on the channel's happenings aside from subscribing, I recommend listening to the Essays and Espresso podcast. The footage I used in this video was applied by Felix Fletcher, Mewdoll, Classic L337, Burnt Pins Gaming, and World of Long Place, as played by Descala, who are all linked below. Also linked below is my Patreon, where I give early access to videos to members. Right now, you can catch the Deus Ex analysis early for as little as a buck. I hope this video was worth the time you spent watching it. I'll continue my exploration into the pre-Miyazaki FromSoft library in August with a video on Kingsfield 4 and something else. Something non-FromSoft, which I haven't decided on yet. If you want to throw some ideas for games you'd like to see covered next August, be sure to give me your suggestions in the comments. I've been HR Aesthetics, and until next time, take care.